Something goes wrong. Like with the Exxon Valdez, I think you've had a bunch of them here. The ecosystem never recovers, right? Uh, it's been, what, 20 years since the one up in Alaska? They still don't have their fish back. They don't have their birds back. When you don't have fishing, and it was a fishing village, it means you don't have a livelihood. That's just the beginning of what is wrong with an oil disaster. You don't want it here. You've got a gorgeous harbor. You've got an economy that functions better than a lot of other places. You've got more than 200 species of wildlife in your little ecosystem that's just around the water's edge. You're not gonna have it anymore. You're not gonna have beauty. You're not gonna have tourists. You're not gonna have quality of life after there is a problem with an oil tanker, right? And there's no way to be careful enough. These things happen. So the way to have them not happen is to have no more tankers. I'm going to give Ben a minute to talk about how this has played out in Vancouver. How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right. So um, anybody want to guess how many oil tankers are in the Brewer Inlet right now? Too many. Too many. Fifteen. No, there's there's actually six right this moment. Um, but actually what we've been averaging um, is about two a week. Um, and each one of those carries somewhere in the neighborhood of three times as much as was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. Uh, does anybody know who owns the, uh, the oil tanker terminal in Burnaby? Kinder Morgan. Anybody know who Kinder Morgan is? Out of Texas. You know what they did before they had Kinder Morgan? I'm trying to be interactive here. All right. They, they were two former Enron executives. Yeah, and they took that money and then they bought this company, Kinder Morgan, or they created this company, I should say, and then that company bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It's actually where all the oil that's used in BC comes from, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It's been there since about 1952. Uh, but it's only been since 2005 that Kinder Morgan have made this really about export. For a long time, that pipeline just kind of serviced the local community. And when you talk about tankers, they say, oh, we've been running tankers forever. Well, it's true. There's been tankers going up and down the coast, moving refined products to small communities, you know, helping the fuel get up to, you know, Bella Bella or wherever else. But it's only a new thing that this has actually been a major uh, oil exporting facility, the, the Kinder Morgan terminal in Burnaby. You, remember, you might remember in 2007, there was a big oil spill. Does everybody remember the oil spill in 2007? Nod at me if you remember the oil spill in 2007. Thank you very much. You can twinkle too if you want. All right, thank you. So uh, in 2007, there was an oil spill. It was actually a relatively small spill, but it was for a lot of people the first time they even realized there was oil coming through the inlet. Um, and what you probably don't know though, is at the same time that oil spill was happening, there was actually a, uh, uh, a consultation happening with stakeholders. And you might think, well, who are those stakeholders? Was it uh, First Nations or was it uh, the citizens of British Columbia? You can probably guess where I'm going with this. The stakeholders that were involved were tugboat captains, tanker captains, there were oil companies, there were banks. They, had, they were not you or I. And right at the same time that oil spill was happening, this risk assessment panel came together and actually decided that we would allow bigger tankers to move through the inlet. Uh, and it decided that we should increase the dredging of the inlet so that we can allow the bigger tankers to pass by and that we should start experimenting with shipping oil to Asia from the Vancouver Harbor. So you've probably heard a bit about the Enbridge pipeline up north that's got a lot of attention recently. You've probably heard about the Keystone pipeline down into the United States that's a, a big, big issue, and I think Jane's going to talk some more about that. Um, you know, about a thousand people got arrested down outside of the White House uh, in one of the biggest acts of civil disobedience around an environmental issue in, in a very long time. Margo Kidder got arrested there, amongst others, that's right. Can I get a woohoo for Margo Kidder? Thank you. And Daryl Hannah. Apparently, woo is the noise for Daryl Hannah, everybody. All right. <laughs> So um, the, the, what you probably haven't heard as much about, though, is that there's a plan to actually make the, the pipeline that runs into Vancouver or into the, Bur into the Burrard Inlet about the same size as either one of those tankers, about a 700,000 barrel a day pipeline. In 2008, the, uh, the existing pipeline, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, was expanded by about 50,000 barrels a day. It's up to 300,000 barrels a day total now. 
Um, and the amount of tankers that are going through the inlet is increasing all the time. It went from 22 tankers that went through our inlet in 2005 to about 79 in 2010. We're going to see probably over 100 this year. Uh, and the plan is by 2016 to get up to about 300 large oil tankers going through our inlet and for that pipeline to get to be about the same size as either the Enbridge pipeline or the Kinder Morgan pipeline. How do you guys feel about that? Yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about it too. So the problem is that because this is an existing pipeline and it's an existing tanker traffic route, there's very little within the system that can be done at this point. There's no public consultation meetings. There's no environmental assessment process. There's no oversight. But what we can do is we can get in the way of them. We can, we can actually physically stop them. We can say no to them. We can demand public consultations. To their credit, our mayors uh, from across BC actually sent a letter to Kinder Morgan um, at, as of the last Union of BC Municipalities meeting uh, saying that they wanted public consultations to happen. Uh, unfortunately, our, our municipal officials actually have no ability to stop the tankers at this point. But our provincial government can do a lot and our federal government is ultimately the one that's responsible. Um, so really the first thing is you got to tell your friends and neighbors about this because nobody even knows that these tankers are out there. You see a lot of ships out in the inlet, but it's hard to know what's a crude oil tanker, what's moving refined products, what's moving, uh, you know, all kinds of other stuff. You might not know this, but there's a lot of asbestos that comes through that terminal. We got a lot of uranium coming through that area. Uh, we, we got one of the biggest raw material ports anywhere in the world right here in North Vancouver, definitely the biggest one in Canada. Uh, and it was just expanded last year as part of the Gateway Project. You've probably heard about the Gateway Highway Project, the South Fraser Perimeter Road and the, the twinning of the Portman Bridge. Everybody nod their head if you know what I'm talking about. Right, twinkling, thank you. Uh, so that Gateway Project is actually part of a much bigger plan, the Asia Pacific Gateway Corridor Initiative. The idea is to uh, change who our trading partners are. Right now, Canada is almost entirely dependent on the United States for selling all of our raw materials. Uh, you know, most of Canada's economy, as I'm sure most of you know, is basically just selling raw materials to the United States. You know, we export raw logs, we're exporting bitumen, we export pretty much anything you can think of that comes from the earth, send it down to the United States, don't actually manufacture a heck of a lot. In fact, as we uh, export more and more bitumen, the value of the Canadian dollar goes up and up. And you can see the value of, uh, of oil and the value of our dollar basically tracking exactly the same. Uh, and what that's done is it's made it harder and harder to manufacture stuff here. The one competitive advantage we had was that our dollar was worth less. And if you go over to that Labor Organizers Committee tent, I bet you they'll tell you a lot about this. You know, the, the small manufacturing sector we did have in Canada has shrunk drastically, largely because of the oil sands. And if, you t if people tell you that the oil sands are good for our economy, it's true there's people who make a lot of money working there. But there's a huge cost that comes with it, leaving aside the fact that, you know, climate change is the biggest issue facing humanity today. And Canada is the, you know, the one thing we are manufacturing here is global warming. We're one of the biggest suppliers of the stuff that actually causes it left on the planet. You know, there's an award that's given out every year to the country that does the most to block uh, the climate negotiations. It's called the uh, Fossil of the Year Award. Who wants to guess who won that award the last five years? That's right. Canada won that award the last five years. How do you feel about that? Shame! Can I get a shame? Shame! Thank you very much. So, you know, the question is, what do we do about it? Well, if you want to stop the growth of the tar sands, like I said, this is the one way that that oil is making its way to market right now. It's right through that inlet, right over there. In a lot of ways, we're at the center of the storm of the fight against climate change, the fight against an oil spill, the fight against the tar sands, right here in our backyard. But of course, if we're ever going to really stop it, we need to not only stop the supply, we need to stop the demand too. And that's why I mentioned the gateway highways. Um, because those highways are really what causes the demand for the oil. I think as Jane's going to tell you a bit more about, you know, this oil is really not about energy. It's not about turning your lights on. It's about running our automobiles. Oil is about automobiles, and particularly the bitumen from the tar sands is all about running our automobiles. So the decisions that are made about whether we invest in public transit or in highways, the decisions that are made about whether we support, you know, the initiatives to actually expand our public transit system instead of, you know, spending millions of dollars to put up security gates to make sure poor people can't get into transit, you know, instead we should be putting that money into in investing in public transit because that's exactly what drives the demand for oil. Most people would prefer to have effective, affordable public transit. Most people would like to have that option, but they don't have it. Uh, you know, the folks uh, out in the valley in particular, and anybody who lives south of the Fraser, has about a third of the uh, access to fossil fuel.